This week, we welcome John McClure, Chief Information Security Officer at Loria Education, to discuss accelerating security with security automation. In the leadership and communication section, developing a risk management approach to cybersecurity, how automation can protect against data breaches, the problem with cyber insurance, outdated incentives, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Cyber criminals are using social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard-to-detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 212, recorded April 5th, 2021. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in sunny Colorado. Joining me from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island is my first co-host, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Hey, Matt. Good to be here. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Passover. Easter, right. All the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> and joining us remotely today is my second co-host, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Happy, happy. These darn four o'clock meetings that we have to have, you know, I wish I could be in studio, but business calls. Yeah. I, I was smoking a Padron last night. Renee's oh. here. Yeah. So we, we were hanging out, yeah. you know, after Easter and, and I pulled out the cigars and Paul, you gave me this beautiful... I think it was the 1964 or whatever. And oh, I'm yeah. like, oh my Can't gosh. Can't go wrong oh. with the drones. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a great you know, smoke last night. I, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't break out in 1926 yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. It was a good day to do it. Do you want to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to your favorite podcast catcher. Or our YouTube channel, sign up for the mailing list, join our Discord server, and follow us on our newest live streaming platform, Twitch. You'll also also notice some new branding out there, the new Security Weekly logos, uh, some new type fonts, colors, etc. All have been updated on securityweekly.com. John McClure is the Chief Information Security Officer for Laureate Education. He is a proud military veteran. John has worked for more than 20 years in the in the critical infrastructure and information security arena and supported the federal government and intelligence community community before transitioning to the commercial sector. John, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, when we were deciding a topic for this, two topics came up, and it's funny because to me, uh, I've tried to combine them, vulnerability management and security automation. And we're going to talk more about the security automation side, but to bring everybody kind of full circle, one of the things I tried to do when Paul and I were at at Tenable was to get someone like Tenable and even the other vulnerability management players to think about the automation pieces of not just collecting the data about the vulnerability, but doing something with it, right? Some sort of automated patching or something, right? And so when you propose the two topics, I'm like, oh yeah, we can talk about this for hours. Um, but to get us started, when I wrote the description for this, uh, I was, I, I looked at your, uh, one slide and I said, all right, so is anybody dealing with alert overload, manual processes, multiple disparate tools, talent shortage and, or budget constraints? And the answer is, of course, everybody <laughs> <laughs> who isn't right. <laughs> Yeah, so let's start with the challenges that most organizations face. You know, describe this from from your perspective, being at uh, Laureate Education. You know, uh, obviously, a lot of people struggle with these challenges, but let's put it into perspective. Yeah, I think for us, especially, we have a pretty lean team and a pretty wide um, landscape in terms of what what we need to protect and defend against. You know, Laureate's a a global corporation, you know, we, we have over 20 universities, 
in our portfolio, and most of them are in Central and South America, a uh, little bit in North America. But um, you know, about fifty thousand employees or so, a little bit clo- pretty close to three quarters of a million students. So we've got a lot to protect. And like 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 you hit on earlier, I mean, those those constraints that I think we're all challenged with um, are tough. And so um, I think one of our early drivers was for sure the overload of, of the amount of alerts we're getting and how we could really deal with that in a logical way, as well as that talent shortage, which is super tough, um, especially here in the United States in terms of finding enough staff and enough qualified staff and being able to retain them. So you know, we started looking obviously at a different number of different approaches. Um, for sure, we landed on um, SOAR, that orchestration and automation piece that we thought was missing. And we really think that's continued to be the future um, for what we'll build around that. We, we know that we can't hire ourselves out of this challenge in terms of overload. Um, we know that we can't buy ourselves out of it. There's surely not one more product that we could put in our arsenal of tools that would put us in you know, the better place, get us over the proverbial hump. So we really are more and more leaning into and forward on the orchestration automation side. So let's talk about staffing for a second, right? You sure. said, you know, you don't have a big staff. I mean, how many are on your security team? Are they all local in the U.S.? Or are they kind of remote and scattered all over? I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. So about half of my staff is inside the United States, and about half is spread, with, spread between Brazil, Mexico, and Peru. So we have a staff of probably all in all about 35 folks. Um, spread spread pretty evenly between the U.S. The U.S. team primarily focused on large global initiatives that impact all of those regional universities in different countries. And then we have some some local teams uh, embedded in Mexico, Peru, et cetera, that, um, that, that really focus on delivering locally. So we're pretty, you, pretty distributed. Yeah. And I'm just curious from a recruiting perspective, is it easier for you to recruit in the States or over in the other countries? Yeah, um, I would, I mean, I, perhaps a little easier um, personally to tap into my, my networks in the United States and people that I've known for, for ages. But in t- And in terms of some of the more complex skill sets um, and some of the newer tool sets, um, I think we've had better luck in the United States. I think for some of the um, skill sets that might be a little um, less specific around a tool set, I think we've been able to find that um, locally pretty easily as well. But for example, we're, we're pretty heavily invested in Cortex um, on the orchestration side. And for us to find that skill set, we've had a lot better luck inside, inside the U.S. Got it. So let's, yeah, let's yeah. dig in a little bit to Cortex and, and, and sure. security automation in general, right? Um, let's see. Cortex is the old Phantom product, right? Um, no, Palo Alto, the old... Uh, Oh yeah, no, it was. Um, yeah, I can't remember now who, who which one they bought. Yeah, Fa- Splunk bought Phantom, I think. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was uh, not Immunio. No, I had it and then I lost it. Damn it! It'll come yeah, back I to me too. Remember. Yeah. Anyways, so you're using Cortex. So let's talk orchestration automation. Anyways, like Demisto. How do you start? Demisto. Demisto. Thank Demisto. you, John. That's right. Gosh. Too many acquisitions. <laughs> we can't keep them all the, yeah, I can't keep them straight <laughs> anymore. So when you, when you went down this path, I mean, where did mm-hmm. you start? Because when you think about orchestrate automation, there you could start in a lot of different places. I mean, obviously one area because you're probably a Palo Alto shop is you know the firewalls and, and logging and some other stuff. But kind of walk us through how did you approach orchestration automation in your environment? Yeah, for us specifically, I think obviously there's a few different approaches that have been applied and, and not all SOARs are the same, for sure. Um, some are super, super capable and require a lot of programming type knowledge around that team. Um, and then there are other ones that also help focus on case management and, and some things like that. So for us specifically, um, we knew that we also wanted um, uh, an application and program that could help us with case management as well. So for us, that, 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 that limited our field a bit. Um, to, to your point, Phantom, I think, was the big leader when we started looking. Um, and they had recently been acquired by Splunk, which was attractive to us as a, as a Splunk shop. But um, when we really started looking for other capabilities beyond, beyond just the automation, 
but also case management and some of the reporting and things that we want to get out of it, um, as well as some of the licensing um, specifics that were attractive to us that really helped us focus in pretty quickly on on the, the solution that provided kind of, kind of checked all those boxes. Again, nothing. I, I think there's a, some fantastic products out there in the space, uh, but some of them really deliver some different capabilities than, than the other ones beyond just simple automation. Yeah, so yeah. case management is being a big part of that. All right, so sure. you select your tool. Yep. Which use cases did you go after first? Like, where did you decide to focus your mm -hmm. initial automation processes? Because, again, the list is long, so where do you start? For sure. Yeah, for us, it was interesting. And I think a lot of people kind of get the cart and the horse kind of in different orders for this. You know, one of the things we made sure going in was that we really had well-defined processes. I think a lot of people think, hey, we're ready to could go down this automation path before perhaps they really have well enough to find processes and playbooks on how they actually do the work to get automated um, and, and get all excited about the automation play before being ready. So I think we spent a lot of pre-work getting ready. And then after we acquired the product, uh, the, the, the first things that we knew we'd be able to do was we really focused on those super high fidelity alerts that are always, always go the same way. You know, so for example, whether it's C2 traffic or uh, command and control traffic or certain types of malware that we see that we know this is malware. We know, we know we're not going to accidentally automate something here, um, unintended and have unintended consequences back to, uh, the, the infrastructure or to the business. So we really focused on the super high fidelity. 100% of the time, this is what this is and this is how I always handle it. So we're able to find some early use cases like that that really started to um, help us work through how the product worked, how we could integrate it, um, how we could gain confidence with it, really get start getting some good reporting out of it, um, start seeing some savings, time savings, cost savings, et cetera, out of it pretty early um, before we moved on to some of the more, the more complex automations that we work with today. Now, now that's a good yeah. point. Now, so for folks going into uh, looking at a SOAR platform, your recommendation would be make sure you have your processes solid, make sure you have your playbook solid uh, ahead of the game, right? So you're, so you're not behind yeah. the curve on the implementation. Um, were there any adjustments in your playbooks or processes you had to make to align with the platform itself? Like for our listeners, is there anything they need to think about if they do have well-defined processes already and they're ready to make the jump into a SOAR platform? Were there any adjustments or tweaks you had to make to align with the technology? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think we had to really tweak our processes um, a lot, but but it, it was interesting because we thought we had really, really well defined processes and methodologies on, on how we approached some of these tasks. And but as we as we started applying those, it started dawning on us, oh yeah, we also do this and we also do this. So it it continued to help us kind of think through and really put on paper some tasks that were getting executed, but um weren't either executed as frequently or were just kind of, oh, yeah, I also do that. And it, and it really hadn't right. been codified in some of our, our written and, and established playbooks for, for specific um, analysis tasks. So yep. and on the technology side, not, not really any adjustments, though, as we began to um, automate things, um, we realized we might, we might need to increase a volume license for this or that that would go out and and do a lookup, for example, whether we're looking up something on virus total, or in the past, maybe an analyst would go there once or twice during the day, you know, for automating this a thousand times, we're going to go there a thousand times. And so um, there maybe were some slight tweaks in, on the licensing side for a couple of things. But overall, um, I, I think a lot of the big players in this space are um, well integrated. And obviously, the SOAR platform itself is built for integration. So, mm -hmm. so not a lot of uh, changes on the technology side. So Jason's nodding. So that, that sounds like you answered the, all those questions. Um, process, right? So it's an evolution of process, really, because For sure. you had a, a well-documented process and, mm -hmm. and actually you, you evolved it and expanded it mm -hmm. probably as you were mm -hmm. implementing it within the tool. For sure. Yeah. Again, we, we really thought we had it nailed. Um, and, and that's why I think, as again, folks who are out there and looking at it, again, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to accelerate time to detection, reduce dwell times, cost savings, um, try to tackle some of that manpower challenges we're talking about and skill sets. But 
it is it's tough and, and it's complex. You, you for sure need to make sure that you know what you're after, you know what integrations you're looking for, um, how you're going to measure success, right? Is it I'm going to I'm going to automate this much or is it I'm going to be able to transition some of my skilled staff more to the challenging tasks at hand and threat hunting and that type of thing? Or or how are we really going to measure success? Because at the end of the day, as a technology leader, I know I'm going to get asked. Um, hey, what was our ROI? How did this improve us as a company? You know, wh- what's your real return here? And so we we also define that early on too, because I think that's can be a little squishy for people um, on what is success of automation. You know, they talk a lot in the security space. Success is nothing happens, right? Nothing reportable happens. And so, how did we make something reportable out of out of this deployment that really told a good story back to the business? So it was uh, it, it was something we really thought through early and a lot. And, and, it, and it went slower, even though we thought we were extremely well prepared. Um, it went a bit slower than we'd hoped, but, but I think now we've got some good momentum behind us. So I want to, before, I want to go into the business case a little more in a second, but I want to talk mm-hmm. about the other technologies you had in the environment. I mean, what, what's the bare minimum from a technology stack and maturity stack in, in your tool set? And I'm also curious, you know, are there things you decided to get rid of or replace because they were no longer needed. I'm just, I want people to understand kind of what are like the bare minimum tooling that needs to be in place before a SOAR really starts to make sense. Yeah, for us, uh, a SIM, um, and then whatever might be feeding that, I mean, to your point, you know, our technology stack's not terribly unique um, compared to probably a lot of big businesses out there, whether it's uh, you know, firewalls and IPSs and anti-malware products, EDR, et cetera. Um, so all of that was, is feeding into our SIM, which does a lot of the early correlations and deduplications and things like that before it hands it off to the SOAR. So um, the SIM, super critical for us, obviously the SOAR. And then on the backside of the SOAR, uh, you know, how, how are we handling the data when the, the SOAR is done with it? At least the, the security piece, right? Whether that's ticket creation and and that sort of thing, and, and we're happen to be a Surface Now shop, um, but but it's interesting because I think that in terms of the replacement question, um, which, which also feeds into what do I need in the stack, um, I I think that there's a day where there we're going to see some convergence between SIM and SOAR, and I think we're seeing some of that already, though it has a ways to go. Um, you know, SOARs are great for doing what I want you to do today with it. Um, and, but, but not, not as good if I need to go do a look back for a long period of time that I might need to do in a forensic investigation and really need to lean more heavily into my SIM. But, but, but we are seeing where people are connecting tools directly into their SOARs. Um, that's not something we're doing right now. Again, we're, we're, we're kind of pre-staging everything and doing a lot of data manipulation and massaging in the SIM before handing it to the SOAR. But I think ultimately there may be that displacement opportunity um, for a SIM, or we'll see the SOAR become part of the SIM, and we'll see more of that natural integration between the two. Yeah, but it th- sounds like the gap, though, that's missing still in mm-hmm. order to take your tool set directly into a SOAR is the look back, right? And you're leveraging the SIM for look back and investigation. So until you replace that capability, you're still kind of stuck with the SIM? Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. And, and the SIM surely is built for these long-term storage um, um, opportunities and requirements, as well as uh, we, we've already got a lot of correlation written in there that, that we don't necessarily have, have that logic yet in the, in the source. So, yeah, that, that ability to look back and to do those, those longer-term um, investigations that might require me to go back or, or even looking for patterns in data, right, that, that needs to go back a longer period of time. Um, I'm really... The, the SOAR is great for, here's this event, let's go do some things around that event or that incident. Um, we, we have done some unique things um, that, that some other customers at um, Palo Alto, in this case, hadn't done before in terms of um, actually circling back and feeding that data from the SOAR back into the SIM to continue to make that data more usable and to update cases and things like that. So the integrations between them are pretty, pretty strong right now. Um, but until you really see the SOAR also being a data management tool, an event management tool like the SIM, I, I, I think that's where it still needs to be quite a bit stronger before it could really displace the SIM. That's interesting. I want to go down the business case a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, a lot of people, you know, it, it depends on who you talk to. I'm a believer security automation helps us fill some gaps with resources and some of the other challenges that we have. Some people, I, I hear, look, I don't want to automate because I don't want to break something. How, how do you, from a business case perspective, kind of how do you bridge the pros and the cons of, of automation? Yeah, yeah. And th- that was one we had early on as well, right? And, and we still do. We still do. Um, we, we don't want to automate ourselves into a problem for sure, because we can do it really fast and we can do it at scale. And so we, we are very, um, I think, cautious in terms of, of how, what parts of the playbook we've automated and what parts still require intervention, right? So there are playbooks from, from you know, cradle to grave that are fully automated, right? No, no analyst intervention. Nobody does a check. We're, we're again, high fidelity alert. We're going to handle it this way every time, whether an analyst looks at it or doesn't. He's a, it, the answer is always going to be yes at the end or no at the end. Um, but but there is other ones that that we don't have that confidence level in, and we do um, make sure that there's multiple in, in some cases multiple checks where an analyst intervenes, looks at what the SOAR has done to date, helps it do the next fork in 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 the playbook. Right? Oh yes, this really still looks bad, or no, let let's close the case here. Or, or take another fork in the playbook. So um, depending, I think, on our own confidence level of, of that decision being able to be made um, well at a large percentage of the time well, um, really is what drives wh- whether, whether it's fully automated or not. Um, there's also you know, some of them fully automated, even without in, or even with intervention, uh, might just lead to a ticket, right? Which in, in the ticketing system back to IT or back to another business unit, which is probably not terribly disruptive to the business, as opposed to an automation that might isolate a host or or change something in a network configuration as part of a defensive measure. So it, it's really dependent on the playbook, our, our confidence in what we're seeing as we built that playbook out in terms of the fidelity of that alert and the accuracy of that alert over a long period of time. And then, then how confident and what type of response is actually taking place is, is what really gets us to, to how, how that playbook is executed in there. So, so, yeah, John, so, a, so no, sorry, Matt. Go ahead, Jason. No, 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 uh, you're good. So, so many organizations um, struggle with adoption, right? So they mm-hmm. buy the great tool, they put in the great tool, and then they don't realize the amount of effort for care and feeding, that it's a journey, it's not set it and forget it, especially when it comes to a SOAR. What are you sure. doing to ensure adoption rates? Because you know, we, we have customers who, you know, they'll buy technology, ended up coming to us because they're like, we've only adopted 20% of this technology. We need to find mm-hmm. the ROI. We need to get the value out of this. We need to be adopting 80% of the, the capabilities help, right? What, do, right? what are you doing within your organization to ensure that adoption rate is high with a, with a tool like this? Because it has to be, right? No, it, it does. It does. Or it pays off. Not at all. <laughs> For sure. It ends up, in, in fact, really introducing even more challenges into your organization if you do it poorly. For us, it, it was challenging, that, that adoption piece. Not the adoption piece of, are we going to put it in place and are we going to deploy it? Because that was just a decision we made from a security risk position that, that this was going to be very beneficial to us in the long run. The adoption piece for us was really making sure we got the analysts to buy in um, and that we had the security operations team buying in who maintains a lot of these platforms and the integrations and really driving home to them that, hey, this is beneficial to you. You know, this is where I need you working out of. Mm -hmm. I know that as good of an analyst as you are, you can't do a thousand of these a day. I know that you can't um, mentally correlate this data in your mind over a thousand cases a day. And so, so, you know, really, I think showing them the benefit early on of mm-hmm. kind of the work I'm going to, to take off your plate to let you go do better and bigger things. Um, uh, took some time, but, but was a sell for sure. It, but, but we, we were getting people out of, um, you know, the individual tool sets and, and trying to do the best they could in a very siloed way. I think um, pretty quickly, though, people started to see the benefit um, and really started to um, be more engaged with the automation team and being able to take, again, take that kind of repetitive, I'm always going to do this the same all the time off. Mm-hmm. I think that people are seeing too, again, as we're talking about skill shortages and talent and, and upskilling, you know, this was really an opportunity for them 
to embrace this and realize that this is the future in some form or fashion that, you know, doing detection alerts and, and clearing tickets is not the future of cybersecurity. And so I think, um, you know, again, it, it took a little bit of effort on our part and a little bit of, um, I think, continuing to show people that have benefits as we had those early deployments, really being able to show people how measurable that was and that they could really start taking some of that time and going looking for the hard stuff started to get people more excited and that helped increase the adoption rate. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And ultimately what it does is it creates that culture of innovation now because now they want to innovate in the tool, right? We're taking a lot of that monotonous noise off their plate and allowing them to, to step up in their role and, and become innovators within the platform. That's great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really created a neat, a neat um, a, you know, excitement within that group and knowing how much more is, is out there. And again, them continuing to progress in their own careers and, and giving themselves more opportunity in the long run. So again, there's have been a lot of these side benefits and it's taken some time, but, but I, I think people are all on board now. Yeah, I think a lot of people feared that security automation meant that it was going to replace their job. Oh, no, there's still plenty of work to do, even with an automation tool. So once you get over that hump, then you can start to see the benefits. And to to Jason's point, you start to innovate and mature and and, and continually improve. I think that's a good measure of success, though, when you've implemented something like that, John, and you see your team innovating on that platform, using it to solve different challenges. you've, You've won. That's a winner. That's a tool that's going to be around for a while. Yeah, exactly right. And, and the people will be too, right? right? Because they're, yeah. they continue to be motivated and engaged and excited. And they know that we're continuing to invest, um, obviously in the program, but also in them. And so it's, you know, it's been a, it's been a great success for us. And, and we are really pushing that space, right? Again, we, we work a lot with the Palo Alto team. Um, and, and they, they've got a great team that, that they pulled over from Domisto and, um, you know, we're doing some unique things in there that some other customers aren't. So again, we're really leaning forward into it pretty strongly. That's great. That's awesome. John, thank you so much for joining us on Security uh, Business Security Weekly. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. You too. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Stopping advanced threats requires knowing exactly what you're up against. ExtraHop Reveal X is the only solution that shows you not just where intruders are going, but where they've been. 90-day look back and complete network visibility across the data center, cloud, and device edge help security teams respond 84% faster with ExtraHop Reveal X network detection and response. Explore the interactive demo at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian and Jason Albuquerque. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed and approved. Our next live webcast will be on April 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern, where you will learn how to prepare for modern ransomware attacks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register now. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, gentlemen, off to our articles for the day. Um, so uh, this first article, Jason, I thought was interesting, right? It's from Stephen Katz. It's from an interview that Stephen Katz did on MSNBC. Um, and it's an article related to a little bit of that story and talking about, you know, what is a CISO and what are some of the responsibilities? Yeah. yeah and, and I thought it was interesting because, it, I, you know, we talk about the evolution of the CISO role, right? right. And yeah. he lists a lot of things that you know, as we look at it, like how many of these are going to stay the responsibility? You know, some of these are newer probably for some yeah. people that are in the role. And, and honestly, I think there's some some items missing that have become responsibilities of CISOs, right? I, I call out right away business resilience, business continuity and recovery. 
Those, those are things that as a CISO, I had a level of responsibility for working with the IT team, right? Yeah, that was even before I became CIO because we needed to create that uh, ability to quickly recover, right? So you had to work with the IT teams on that recovery model, um, you know, the, 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 the processes, the playbooks, all of that. So that was, you know, there's there's some things in here. There's 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 added responsibility. Uh, governance is another one, right? I mean, security plays a role in overall IT governance. So I can, you know, there's there's a few in here to this list that I'd love to be able to add. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he does talk about governance here, and I've always talked about how I believe the CISO will take a broader governance role, yep. especially in an environment where a lot of stuff is moving outside of a, a on-prem data center into third-party relationships, whether it's yep. infrastructure or platform or s- software as a service, there's a governance component because now sure. your infrastructure, you may not own it, but you've got to govern the relationship with yep. Who, yep. who is running it for you, right? Right. And then, and then ultimately in there, you have to have things like the legal side, right? Uh, regu- regulatory side, you, you know, having those kind of conversations. Um, uh, education. Training and education is another big one, right? Making sure you're educating the organization, making sure you're educating your staff members, um, making sure you have the right training for the right people in play. Um, you know, there, there's a lot there from from a, a training and awareness side. Yeah, you know, I was I was listening to uh, a Joe Rogan episode, and he interviewed the director Tiller Russell. I believe is the one who said it. He actually just uh, released uh, a documentary called Silk Road, a documentary mm. film. Oh, which uh, is actually really good. But he tells this crazy story, bear with me for a moment, where he meets Gary Busey. And uh, like he tells a story like he goes to his house and Busey's like in his bathrobe. He's holding a shotgun and stuff like that. He's <laughs> like, but the one thing Busey told me, and Busey's crazy, he's like, is as a director, you need to be like the hub and the spokes of the wheel and not the wheel. Like your job is to just make yeah. sure the wheel keeps turning and the more you can just kind of be there and making sure, you know, checking in here and there, like not taking an overly active role, like taking over the actor's role or anyone else's mm-hmm. role. I feel like the CISO is the same kind of thing. And listen, sure. you guys describe describe that. It was kind of the same yeah. thing for me that that CISO, there's so many different spokes in that wheel that they really just have to be the hub of all of that. You know, right? you know, it's funny that you say that, Paul, because a, a lot of times with my team and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll attest to it and they'll laugh about it because but I look at it this way. I, I'm not the best violinist in the world. I'm not the best cellist in the world. But what I'm really good at is putting that orchestra of those great yes. musicians together. Another great analogy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, right. and really building some beautiful music. So that's. Now, that's see, if Gary Busey had told he's... you that in his bathrobe, it would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to work that in. I mean, just hold, you know, hold on. Let me go put a bathrobe yeah. on. I'll yeah, be right pretend, back. pretend yeah. your team like, hey, I met Gary Busey once. He was in a bathrobe and he told me I should be the conductor of the orchestra. Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we can have Paul put on the bathrobe. Yeah, and I could be the crazy person us. in the bath. Yeah, the bathrobe. <laughs> Paul told me this once. <laughs> it is bathrobe. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, shotgun, that's my know. own little analogy of how I've put that together yeah. in my brain. Uh-huh. Right? It's right. I'm not here to be the best cellist. Right? That's that's not why I'm I'm in my role. It's to bring everybody together to 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 make a great program. I guess that makes me play the role of Gary Busey in a bathrobe. <laughs> Love it. You're fine with that. Yeah, you're I'm good. good. Ne- next Halloween, buddy. That's what I expect your costume it's fitting, to be. right? <laughs> yes. So that kind of leads a little bit into the second article, which is around reorienting your cybersecurity program, right? So if you think about this, as, as the role evolves, your program needs to evolve, right? Yeah. And, and I thought this was a really interesting way because we talk a lot about risk management and aligning a building a risk posture. There's a couple articles in here this week that that talk about these aspects of how do you build uh, or develop a risk based approach to security. And and so mm-hmm. this next one, you know, obviously start with objectives and risks. We, you know, we did a uh, we did a webcast with DeepWatch last year, late last year, where we got into some of this like mapping of, you know, how do you look at different business objectives and map Mm -hmm. them down to business risks and how does that drive an objective on the security side to implement a control, right? Yeah. Easier said than done, but Mm -hmm. this article starts to talk about aspects of of that alignment. Yeah, no, and I I love it. I mean, this article is is totally wrapped around bringing the security team and the security leaders to the business table, right? Having those strategic conversations with the board, being able to boil down the complex 
um, you know, terminology and language and technical acumen and all of that and boil it down to how do we align to the business, right? How do we align to uh, the growth of the business? How do we align to operational efficiencies of the business? How do we align to, you know, the, the overall uh, personnel type scenario with, with, with hiring to the business, right? Because uh, for us, you know, I really truly believe the more we're embedded in the business units, the better we're going to be at identifying those risks at a business unit level and then be able to boil that up to the leadership of an organization, whether it's the CEO, the CFO, or the board of directors, and have that true business risk conversation. That's when we get elevated. That's when we get elevated in our positions. Yeah, and I think we've done a good job of doing it. And I'll, you know, I'll give you an example with the Excelion breach. Um, I've been talking to some folks about that. Mm. It's really interesting to me. If I think about 10, 20 years ago, the business probably would have come to us even better. We would have had to get ahead of the project or find out about the project too late. And mm-hmm. they're going to put in an FTA right, to transfer files between um, yep. your partners and or customers, uh, usually partners, right, and share data. And they'd be like, yep, so we're going to drop this appliance in and we need you guys to just write some firewall rules for us, right, to make it secure. Right. Now the conversation's very different. As security, we're trying to understand what are the business requirements? How do we implement a system, help the business implement a system that's also going to give us some vo- some visibility into it, right? I think we've progressed maybe in uh, midway through, like, well, yep. users need training and we need DLP. You know, now we're like, how do we design a solution that's both secure and serves the sure. needs of the business? And everyone's having that conversation together. I mean, honestly, Paul, we're winning when we have at the seat of the table, when we're just helping the business decide what product, what product we're going to go with, mm-hmm. what application we're going to go with. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah. you know, with, with the business unit leaders around my organization, the conversations that I had early on was bring us to the table first, because the last thing I want to happen is we begin to invest in a product that we come across and say, we can't use this because, or it brings too much right. risk to the organization because, mm-hmm. right? Right. So, so I tried to, to give them visibility into the more proactive you are with security, the better off we're going to be at the end of all this. And to be honest with you, we may be part of helping you find the truly best product because we're going to vet it from a security perspective, but we're also going to be in there looking at feature functionality because it's part of how we do, how we test the application. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not just a, even a question of build it or buy it, right? There's so many different yeah. aspects. When it, actually, in this solution, I was like... There's so many cloud native services. We have developers mm-hmm. like, can we just like, we don't have to build the whole thing our own. We can use right. cloud native services yep. and let, let Amazon or one of the other cloud providers exactly. provide that functionality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even vetting a third party that we want to buy a product from. Yep. Bring us in up front, right? We can be part of that vetting process. If you have, if you bring three platforms to the table, the security score around that should count for something, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. business risk is going to be brought to the organization. So we have to we have to be embedded early on. Yeah, and it, it, this ties into Article Four. I'm going to skip three for a second because, mm. again, it's aligning to those enterprise goals. Yep. But again, part of this comes down to risk posture, right? And and yep. again, the business is going to make the decision on whether they want to accept aspects of that risk. So to your point, Jason, if you're engaged with the business, having these discussions early on, it's going to help you kind of streamline to say, well, all right, these risks you don't want to take on. These risks are okay. Maybe that helps us decide which direction we're going to go to solve this problem. And and that is a risk management discussion. Totally. And and, and honestly, I look at it as more of a um, a highlight to security versus because this article talks about, you know, traditionally uh, security teams being seen as insurance and cost centers and, you know, little return to the business. Taking that position Highlight security as a as an organization that can bring a positive impact to the business, right? Because now we're positioned in that fashion. We're ahead of the game, and we're bringing intelligence to the business units or to the leadership. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the third article, which we skipped over, talks about automation. Uh, and I brought this article in because of our last conversation, yep. right? I mean, the ability to look at areas, look at specific use cases where automation helps to take some of the pressure off the business. I mean, I thought John did a really good job of describing kind of his methodology Mm -hmm. and kind of his process of how he approached the automation side. This article ties into aspects of that as well. You know, there are some use cases that make sense for automation, and there may be some that you can automate pieces, but not the whole thing because I need an analyst. Yep, yep. No, 100%. And, and you know, John's approach to, to implementing SOAR was outstanding. I mean, 
uh, you know, kudos to him for realizing if you don't have strong processes up front, the technology is not going to do it for you, right? You have to make sure that your run books, your playbooks, your, your, your processes are, are solid and up to date. And then that's going to translate into the technology that you can then perform some great automations with. But, you know, for, for organizations that may not be as mature in building out their playbooks and, 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 and have documented processes, do that first. Put the investment yeah. in first so that way you can take advantage of the technology and get to that 80% adoption rate like he's looking down the barrel of, right? Yeah. No, I think he brought up some very good points. Look, without having your base processes document, don't even think about SOAR, right? Because everybody just thinks about it from a technology perspective. Yep. I'm like, just going to buy this thing and put it in. Yep. What use cases are you automating? It's going to solve all yeah. my problems, right? That's it's it. a solution. It should just solve my problems. Right. That's 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 the backwards mentality. We yep. can't have that, right? It's, if, if we do that, you just have a shiny, blinky light in a data center. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> Talking about outdated incentives, so this article in Cyber Insurance, I was kind of intrigued in. I don't. There, there's some plugs for some technology in here, which I wasn't yeah. interested in. It's right. more about what's going to happen in the cyber insurance space, and and what this article talks about is some of the outdated in, incentives, mm-hmm. right? Talking about that blinky light, you know, <laughs> buy cyber insurance because it solves all my problems. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> right. No, I mean, at, at the end of the day. Um, I struggle. I struggle with the conversation because, you know, cyber liability assurance is something we have to have. You know, I mean, our customers expect us. Those are questions on vendor risk management assessments, mm-hmm. right? I Do know. you have cyber liability insurance? Answer no to that and see what happens, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. But I, but I also struggle with the value because there have been way too many instances, way too many stories that I've seen when the stuff hits the fan and, and you know, the customers need the cyber liability insurance and they need it to kick in and they need it to be successful. Then all of a sudden, the insurance companies are going down the ticker. Oh, well, you didn't do this. And you said you, you, know, you attested that you really did that. Guess what? No payment for you. So I've seen too many horror stories like that. Um, and, and, and we're still negotiating for ransom. I literally just saw it the other day happening, right? Well, one of the, one of the folks on my team brought it to my attention. And they, they showed me that it was published online by the threat actors. It literally you know, uh, messages back and forth of them negotiating live with, with the ransomware teams. Right. Mm. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I struggle. I struggle with it. So, I mean, think about this for a second, Jason, right? Like what, what would you do different or how are you preparing that? Yes, you need the cyber insurance, but what are you doing in addition to make sure that if you need it, it's there and it's going to get paid because to your point, right? They're going to go down the list and go, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do this. Therefore, we're not going to pay. So, so how do you reconcile that as an organization? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's all, it's about building a strong security program. I mean, that's the key, right? If, if you're doing all the right things in your security program, you won't have to worry about that checklist. Uh, I mean, I would still take a look at it and make sure and I've had instances where I've talked to my insurance company and said, is this like from 1980? Like, what are you, what are you trying to achieve here? And, mm-hmm. and, and we've been able to influence as subject matter experts, a change in their questionnaire, right? So, so I think that we as, as, as CISOs need to make sure we have strong fo- foundational programs that, um, you know, that we're constantly testing, we're constantly building muscle memory around. Uh, risk-based approach. So, so bring the risk-based approach to to the organization, to your uh, to your leadership, and make sure you're following a risk-based program. Because um, yeah, you don't want to get caught where you know uh, one check in the box that uh, that the insurance company feels you didn't uh, you didn't comply with. Um, it, it basically, gets it to the point where you're not getting any insurance payment. I think we're coming and, down and, to this, and, and I would challenge them honestly. I yeah. would work with your insurance companies and challenge them. It's not, you shouldn't like look at cyber insurance as something that replaces anything you do in your security program. You have to have that. The best use case I've heard for cyber insurance is everyone's going to get hacked at some point. But if you incur costs, provided you're doing your due diligence and you have a security program, 
it yep. can help offset some of those costs. I forget who it is who said that. That's when cyber insurance like yeah, totally. made sense for me. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, because you're gonna have to maybe hire a PR company, yep. have Mandy come in, you know, and do forensics, and it can maybe it doesn't pay for even for all of that stuff, but if you can sure. offset some of those costs by having an insurance policy, it doesn't supplement anything you do in your security program. You still no. need to do all of those things. Absolutely. And think think about it this way. I have homeowners insurance, but yeah. I still have my carbon monoxide and smoke detectors in my house, right? And you still get and you still <laughs> get like your, that. You still get your trees like pruned and take down trees exactly. that may fall on your house too. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. right. Right. But I mean, I think the point is to an extent, right, is you've you've got to do the right things so that your cyber insurance policy does offset some of those costs. Correct. Where yeah. people who are buying cyber insurance thinking that it's the magic solution and not doing anything are going to be in a rude yeah, awakening that, that, when they need it. Mm-hmm. That's it. That Yeah, because... I mean, at the end of the day, it's not a great business model if the insurance companies are always paying out, right? It's <laughs> no, not I for mean, them. That, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely, that's not what insurers are in the business of, right? right. They don't want to pay out all those claims all the time because then exactly. what you're going to see, and the rates have gone up some. I think he, I think they mentioned some rate increases. They were minimal. But I mean, the more we pay out, the, the higher these premiums are going to get too for organizations yeah. that are even doing the right thing. So right. That, that's the downside. I, I, and, and honestly, you know, I, I think insurance companies could step up to the plate a little bit too and maybe do a little bit better diligence than sending you mm-hmm. 10 questions in a Word document to attest to. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think there are some really good ones that actually do because we've we've done some segments on this in the past mm-hmm. on uh, S- Security and Compliance yep. Weekly. There are some good – I think there are you know, a, a handful that I think do a much better job of the due diligence process mm-hmm. to make sure yep. that they're pricing these uh, programs correctly. And then right. you have a bunch that don't. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing. It should become standard across all of the insurance companies. Yeah. Uh, last article I had to bring in here because I thought um, Doug did a fantastic job with this last week. It's how to use recognition to provide mm-hmm. a morale boost. And and I think it's good for leaders to know what the impact of giving out recognition to employees and, and what yep. that does, especially in an environment that we're in today where you can't do these in person a lot. Right. So right. Cyber Risk Alliance did their all hands last week. And I thought... I, when I read this article, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, th- this is a perfect example of yeah. you know Doug, our CEO, coming out with some awards uh, for some individuals, for mm-hmm. some teams. He announced the raises and the bonus structures. I mean, those things I thought were great, right? To really yep. boost morale to the organization. And he followed a lot of the steps that are in this article. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a huge thing. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Yes, folks want um, a salary, a competitive salary, but what do, what do all employees really want to make sure is happening in their job, right? They want to they want to make sure that they're they're delivering some type of a positive impact, right? I mean, why would you? I mean, at the end of the day, I get it. A job is a job, but folks who have passion and, and, and are in it for the career because they love what they do, it, it's it's about that positive impact that can they can make to the organization and to the team. So those are things you have to recognize. And you know what? That, there's so many different ways to do it too. It doesn't have to be an entire company meeting, right? That's great that the CEO mm-hmm. does that. That's awesome. But at a CISO level, you could do it. I mean, you could do it with just a smaller team meeting, right? Uh, an individual department meeting and, and, and give that level of recognition. And hey, by the way, you can nominate up, right? So we have at Carousel, we have something called a Customer Obsessed Success Award, and you can nominate people up for that, for doing, uh, for going beyond their normal, um, their normal job to, to, to make sure that our customers are, are finding value in Carousel and, you know, really going above and beyond to, to, to support our customers. So you nominate can, I mean, them up. You can go the other way too. First job I ever worked, we had the concept mm-hmm. called the brick. So if an employee and one of your fellow coworkers screwed something up really bad, <laughs> they had to display the brick on their desk for the entire time until such time there was another company meeting and someone else screwed up and then the brick would, oh would, public would, shame would with transfer. positive <laughs> positive, shaming. positive. Oh. i didn't want to get the brick <laughs> and it showed like we screwed up i mean the worst case is you could display this brick on your desk until someone about, else screwed how up about, how about for all the good peeps we give them a gold brick <laughs> <laughs> there you go but i think you hit on one thing that's really important purpose 
That's it. Employees want to have purpose, right? And they want to be recognized to continue to be, you know, they want to know that they're making a difference, right? Because if mm-hmm. they're not, that's going to be one of the big factors for them to start looking. If they don't that's- feel appreciated and that they have a purpose in the role that they're in, that that's when they're going to start looking. And these types of things, whether they're on a large scale like Doug did yep. last week on the Cyber Risk Alliance side, or whether they're smaller things that you've done at, at Carousel, Showing appreciation drives up morale. It helps totally. them be appreciated. Yeah. You know, and it, it may sound a little old school, but I, you know, I learned this from one of my CEOs in a past life. Sometimes just writing a small little note and sending it off saying thank you for what you did and, and kind of, you know, just kind of outlining why you appreciate them. And, and leave it on their desk or send it to them in the mail. Yeah, we like used old, to we used to decorate snail mail. We used to decorate the brick with like a little reminder of how the person screwed up. Like if they used the wrong <laughs> floppy, we would like tape a floppy disk to it. That's, that's not the same thing, is it? No, <laughs> no. Don't, wrong way. Oh. This is the nineties. All right, things changed. <laughs> no. So Jason, me, thank I, you for I remember, joining. I remember. I remember. It, it was brutal back then, Paul. <laughs> brutal. So, uh, Jason, I want to thank you for your great positive influence on the show today. Paul, maybe I gave the bad example. All right. Today, that's a bad example. I want people to know what a bad example looks like. Okay, we talk too much about the good examples. We should recognize Uh, things like that. Hey, listen, that's you and your Darth Vader leadership style. That's right. It is is very Darth Vader leadership. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. We're off next week, so we'll see you in two weeks on Business Security Weekly. <laughs>